Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Ari and we cover all things fashion and just the New York City lifestyle over here. This is a little bit of a spontaneous decision. I wasn't going to cover anything regarding New York Fashion Week because why? But I feel like I do have some thoughts. There's some really good stuff out there that I've seen so far, but then there are also some some things we need to talk about. This is gonna be its own little standalone mini series. I'm gonna cover today shows that I have seen that really speak to me and the ones that I feel need a little bit some tweaks, some tweaks need to happen there. All of my thoughts and critiques are coming from a place as a individual who is working in the industry as well as someone who is a design professional and a general fashion lover. So no shade to anybody, this is just, you know, my thoughts, getting them out, expressing them. And I think there are some important topics that I feel need to be discussed that I don't feel are being discussed. As we all know, fashion journalism is pretty much a lost art until you know the Kathy Horns or the Vanessa Friedmans of the world want to you know gather the girls but other than that like, there's really no critique anymore which is I don't know it's kind of a letdown I do feel like critique is necessary in any form of art you have to have it that's the only way that things can improve things can get better like everything is not just gonna be good that just can't be a blanketed overall thought so if this is your thing, please follow along, please continue to watch. I think this format is something that I would possibly continue to do, especially as we progress during fashion months. Paris, Milan, Tokyo just passed, like their fashion week just happened, and there is some really good stuff there, so maybe we might do this for Tokyo as well. So before we start into the actual collections, there's a few questions that I think need to be answered. Is it worth it to show at New York Fashion Week anymore in 2024? <laughs> in my personal opinion, I really don't think that it is anymore. I'm gonna post this clip of this TikTok that I saw and this guy kind of sums up my thoughts about it. So let's watch this here. Paris Fashion Week for women's wear, Milan Fashion Week for men's wear, London Fashion Week for new designers, and then New York. They have a princess cooler. We'll give her. So that's kind of what I feel too. New York Fashion Week is not really, it's not a relevant market to me anymore. I think that's kind of been the consensus for a while now and they honestly have done it to themselves. Even existing in this world of fashion, especially on both sides, working in the industry and also doing the influencing content creator side of things like it's just one big week of brand activations and then you have these little shows sprinkled throughout there's nothing there anymore i think there's other outlets that you could kind of go through in order to show your work and represent your work so you don't have to like keep outputting tons and tons of money i do think that for emerging brands new york fashion week still is a good launching pad if you decide to invest in it it is a good launching pad to get to paris that's kind of how things work the ultimate goal is to show in paris is to get those buyers those editors have your market in paris because the european market is kind of where everything starts that's where everything kind of branches out and then you have you know those ideas kind of filtered out into the other market so as a new emerging brand i do think that it's still pretty viable if you did want to show in New York just to get eyes on your brand to eventually get the market appointments, get the buyers, get the visibility to eventually show in Europe and that allows you to kind of have a little bit of a wider net so you can take your brand global. If you're gonna do it, like make your collection worth it. Make the investment that you're gonna make into producing this body of work, make it worth it. And that's the thing that bothers me sometimes is that a lot of these brands just are not making it worth it. It's just stuff to show and a reason to host an after party. Unless these brands have like a bottomless pit of like money and investors coming in, I don't see the point, especially if these collections are gonna be looking the way that they do. Dabbling a little bit into the overall cost of producing a show, um, the New York Times, I believe, 
last year they came out with an article discussing the overall cost to produce a show. They asked different designers like what the process is like and what the overall monetary investment looks like. And the funny thing is that a lot of the brands that are showing this season for New York Fashion Week were the same brands that were complaining about the cost and the high cost of it to produce a show. I'm just gonna list the ones that I remember in the article. Alina Velez, Kim Shuey, Willie Chavaria, who I love, I think he's great. Um, I do remember he was also in the article talking about how much it cost and he just showed, but he did have a collaboration with Adidas, so Adidas probably did put up a lot of money for that to happen, which is good. I think that is smart. If you're going to show anywhere, make sure you have the sponsors. If you're gonna have a collaboration, make sure they put up the money <laughs> so it's not coming out of your pocket. I think it is kind of on a brand by brand basis, depending on what these brands do, what their signatures are, what they visually create, if it's worth it to physically show their collection on the runway and to kind of flash the numbers of how much it costs on the low end like a small presentation maybe around the 50 60 thousand dollar ring once you get into the larger scale productions when it comes to hiring more of the top tier model you have to start paying for catering transportation for some of these editors and influencers paying for the venue paying for security all those little extra things that can get you up to maybe 100 to 200k and then from there you just you know as you add that just keeps on going so that's a lot of money for a young brand i think it's really interesting to watch and track some of these brands like after they show and seeing if the return on investment is kind of worth it i would probably just do more of like the salon approach where I present the work, but there's no actual like runway presentation, runway show, kind of like what they do for New York Men's Day where they have a collection shown on models and editors, the buyers, the stylists, they kind of cycle in throughout the day to look at the collection and then that's it. I also think that going with the showroom approach is still pretty solid in my opinion. I think that still is a strong showing too of your work. That's kind of how these market appointments and these buying appointments work anyway. I think they're just like pulling things off of a rack and seeing what looks good. So my criteria is going to cover these four things. This is something that I kind of came up with on my own. The first one is approachable. And that pretty much sums up is this tapping into your customer base is this tapping into your target consumer is it covering the customer profile that you set up for your brand is the person who is a frequent shopper who is an avid buyer of this brand are they going to gravitate towards this collection is this in line with what they want to buy is it approachable to your target consumer wearable that's pretty self-explanatory is the collection wearable is it functional is it something that people can wear multiple times over is it something that people can collect for years is it something that people can wear and be comfortable in and showcase in their everyday lives the caveat to that is that i do believe that fashion does not have to be wearable i'm actually a fan of a lot of things that are not wearable i think that's still very important to have some of those more artful avant-garde things circulating throughout the next one is available and what i mean by this is is this collection merchandise well is this a collection that these buyers these market editors they want to showcase on their e-commerce sites they want to have these pieces on their floor because that's how you're going to make money that's how you're going to build longevity and build the reputation that you need as a brand as a sellable brand so the last criteria is visible and for me that kind of meant is your message is your overall inspiration clear as i go through the collection and as i look at it as a whole is the intention there is what you kind of conceptualized three four five months ago is that clear through this presentation that we're seeing today so that comes through with storytelling through narrative through set design through the styling all those little elements are interconnected. So the first brand is Who Decides War. This is a showing from Ev Bravado and his partner Taylor. This is their spring 25 menswear show. I think we'll start look by look and I'll call out any standouts as well as some looks that I 
don't really think work and then we'll kind of recap it as a whole and so the first look look one i think this is a strong opener we have alton mason the god opening the show the first thing that i gravitated towards visually was this leather i'm gonna call it a weekender because it's not technically a tote bag it's that big oversized exaggerated weekender leather bag which i'm a sucker for i love a big obnoxious ignorant just big bag for no reason i love stuff like that so i'm a fan of this i like the coloration on the leather i think that would be a pretty sellable leather goods piece and it could be potentially a staple for their assessment i do like the shape of this look um, the fit of the pants look nice you can't go wrong with a classic trouser but i do like this oversized v-neck we'll call it a tunic and it does have their i would call it their signature sort of distressing technique that they do they do this a lot in denim they do it with knitwear so i do like what they're doing here it's kind of giving a striation creating its own stripe pattern i think that's cool i think that's one of the major keys as you progress as a brand to start to develop your own fabrics and your own signature techniques so I think that they are starting to utilize that a little bit more and I think we'll combine look 2 and look 22 it's the same so look 2 is this wide neck opened cardigan and it has a cutout at the center which is their signature little icon which is a steeple shape I think they pulled inspiration from the Catholic stained glass windows there is that catholic religious imagery and iconography throughout a lot of their collections i think it is smart that they put it in the center as a cutout exposing the body like exposing the torso smart stack sleeves not mad at it i think this is a pretty safe look i wouldn't say that it's a filler look because there is something substantial about it. I think it does kind of add to the overall collection. It's not taking anything away from it. And it does add a little bit to it. It's good. It's good. They did for this season collaborate with um, Pele Pele. So they do have some really nice leather outerwear pieces. The crazy Pele Pele embroidery which you know we all know about. So those are kind of a given because they are known for doing a lot of embroidery on like their denim pieces. So... That kind of does make sense to me. Look three, I really do like this collar shape. So here lies where I start to get a little bit, I start to question things. So who Decides War is definitely a menswear focus. The origin of it was definitely menswear. They have, of course, progressed over to women's wear, including a lot of gowns and dresses. And I think we'll go ahead and get into that portion of my thoughts because they have a very big dress offering in this collection. It's just the construction and the execution of these dresses. It's not hitting. A lot of it comes down to fit, but I think honestly the overall construction of a lot of these dresses just are not up to par in my opinion. And this is where I believe you have to bring in that outside help into your design rooms, into your sample rooms. Because if you're gonna do if you're gonna do dresses, if you're gonna do gowns, if you're gonna try to do bridal, like you need to have those expert master seamstresses who can fit like no other, who they need to be working with your design team. If you're gonna offer more suiting, more coats, more outerwear, you need to have master tailors in your sample rooms. They know how to fit. They know how these shapes work with certain fabrics. So for example, I think honestly look four through six could honestly be a chop look five is just sheer fabric on a body it's just literally just a piece of fabric just draped on the body like look nine okay when i saw look nine i got mad and i mainly got mad because of the jacket and we're gonna break down why i think whatever technique they use to come up with this fabric was interesting it, or it looks like it's this green tool or organza on top of maybe it's like a batting or a fleece something with a little bit of that cloud like quality so this is probably really nice to the touch because it's probably very very soft and plush but let's get into this jacket because I don't know how this got past so many eyes I need to know why why 
So number one, as you can see, it's skewed. It's skewed. You can see from the shoulders and the armhole, it's off. So that means that the balance was not correct when they were fitting or doing the pattern here because it's not aligned. It's not straight. They have the steeple shape stitched in there. Almost gives it a tufted like quality. It's not centered. And I'm really trying to understand why if they wanted to stitch that shape into the center front, that is such an easy shape to just splice in half and have one side on one side of the zipper, the other side on the other side of the zipper. That's it. Easy. Center it and you're done. And when you close it, it'll be one complete visual of the steeple shape. But it's off center and it's not even off center in a smart way. It's not like off center where, okay, we're just going to have it maybe as a chest detail on one side. I don't know what was going on with the placement there. And then you can tell that the hem is starting to flip out. So it's buckling, which is a problem. And it's buckling because wherever they landed that stitching for the steeple shape is making the zipper warp and wave so it's flipping out which is a problem yeah this look was not was not good to me this was a complete chop so the skirt doesn't bother me as much as that jacket but that jacket absolutely not that passed too many eyes for it to not have been corrected before look 12 confuses me as well because I really do enjoy this print. I think this print is really interesting and I would have loved to have seen that print heard more throughout this collection, but it's only in this one look, which is crazy to me. And this is where, going back to my four pillars, this kind of coincides with the available pillar as well as the visible pillar. Because if I was a buyer merchandiser and I saw this come down, which I think is a really great set. I think it's a strong two-piece set for menswear. And this was the only time I saw this print. I would like, I would be a little bit disappointed. This is not a look that I would particularly invest in or buy into because there's no further story with this print throughout the collection. And that kind of ties into the whole visible portion as well because what is this print supposed to be saying with the rest of the collection because it's the only standalone print. So it's kind of like that outlier here where we go back into a full black group. So look 16, look 28, and look 30 kind of tie back into that first look. So for this one I thought they did some really interesting fabric development so instead of the distressed knitting that we saw in look one for look 16 in particular which carries through in look 28 and look 30 um we have this placed trim detail placed in once again following the striations placed in sort of stripes and tell that they are trying to layer it too to create a little bit of depth but i thought that this little trim fabric development patchwork situation was pretty cool. Once you step back at it and you look at the styling and you look at it as a whole, it does give a little bit of uh, Simone Rocha, a little bit of Cecile Bonson. They added their signature like white top stitching on top. I kind of refer to their top stitching and their embroidery a little bit like a chaotic top stitching because it's so irregular. You can tell that they're just like letting the machine kind of do whatever to create that effect. I'm not gonna lie. This look 19, this belted bondage situation with this dress and this high slit with the belt buckles kind of falling as they will. I can see a ton of celebrity pulls for this one, so. We have some more suiting shapes, classic pinstripes. I'm really happy that they decided to carry out this irregular collar situation. I'm gonna call this out too, going back to the dresses, because this also <laughs> bothered me, and this is where attention to detail matters. The fit in the waist, once again, we see that waving and buckling right by the waist. Um, there's some pleating here that once again looks a little bit irregular and off because since the point of the bodice is skewed, the pleating is also looking skewed. So it looks like there's more pleating on the wearer's right compared to the wearer's left, which also affects the center front of the dress. That looks off. 
I really like look 33 going back to that belted element that they did in that tube dress we have it in this beige tying back to that beige color story I thought this was strong I would have loved to have seen this jacket on top of a suit I think that would have been a really cool visual play um putting something that's a little bit more gritty I would have loved to see that play on top of kind of like a classic suiting look 36 I did like back to their sort of heritage of doing shredded distressed denim so I thought this was strong this is another thing where like it's only showing up in like one look I would have loved to see this like play out in like further looks is it approachable for their target consumer I would say yes a lot of these looks are going to definitely be targeted towards the of course celebrity athlete rapper adjacent sector you can tell a lot of these looks are targeted for entrance tunnel looks i guess to the games and that's a whole other thing that i could go on in another video because i have a whole rant about that but <laughs> the way that these athletes are playing the game when it comes to fashion and using it as a crutch it's honestly one of the easiest ways to get put on and to get more publicity and to get more looks and deals wearable yes that's i feel like everything was pretty wearable even some of the more intricate silhouettes available do i see a lot of these looks being placed and bought the leather goods absolutely i could definitely see that being a really high seller on like an h lorenzo essence um, LNCC like some of those more niche online retailers I could definitely see that one belted bondage dress doing well on H Lorenzo like I could see that being a sold-out piece how much is going to be mass-produced and actually gonna be on their seasonal production line I would say probably like less than half of this stuff and that's also going to one of my other points is putting down your collection they showed a 40 look collection which that's usually like the standard like 40 to 50 20 to 30 is on the low end and then you get like past 50 like if you go to like the the 60s and 70s that's for like the yours and the louis and the gucci's too i do think that this collection was a lot of filler a lot of fluff a lot of these styles could have been chopped there's a lot of filler here i think it could have been a really strong tight 30 look collection visibility so in their show notes the whole concept was elevating ascension progression as we've seen with offering way more women's wear going back to the dresses more occasion dresses and also upping their tailoring and menswear so you did see those elements they are playing with those victorian aristocratic elements so you do see that um, especially with like i called out that collar those are just my thoughts on who decides war spring 25 hopefully they bring in more more seamstresses more expert pattern makers for the next go round i would like to see that if they're going to elevate the way that they seem to be on that path ah <sighs> paloma spain oh i love them so much <sighs> Um, started out as a menswear brand based out of Spain. The founder Alejandro is just, he just gets it. He's tapped in. This topped it for, for New York Fashion Week. I'm like so giddy because it was so good. They just did it right top to bottom. So they've been showing in New York I think for I want to say the past two seasons and they switched to a one show a year model which I think is so smart so efficient taking out that extra show so for them i guess you're not going to do a fall 25 show it makes so much sense because then they're able to allocate a lot of those resources and money into the craftsmanship and the overall production of their spring 2025 show so looking at the collection as a whole you know scaling back to see the full visual presentation i love how it is organized and merchandised you can tell there's clear groupings of color that's how your collection should 
sort of flow so we have our white and black groups starting off then we get down to like the browns and the neutrals tying in a little bit more of the black and white from the beginning then we get down to this nice purple color story tying back into this burnt orange and this brown neutral then we go back to blacks back to whites and then we finish with I'm assuming this is their interpretation of a bridal look. As far as colors for spring, makes sense. These brown nudes and neutrals, they still work a little bit dark, but they still kind of have that like fiery intensity that you want to see in summer, especially if you're incorporating that burnt orange, also playing off of this orchid, almost magenta purple. So those colors work well together. Paloma Spain is kind of known for their signature of being like hyper feminine, hyper femininity when it comes to menswear. Also playing up to that era of the 20s and the 30s, you kind of see some zoot suiting silhouettes here with those exaggerated extended collars and cuffs. I love a fur for spring, works for me. And a little bit of a nod to some Western elements with these cow neck scarves with the fringe. We have some embellished fringe pants. So, so let's start with the first look. The first look is strong. You can't go wrong with a floor length evening coat. Like I called out before, this cow neck fringe scarf ascot situation really, really elevates the neckline. That's interest there almost as a decorative element. You don't need any jewelry. Kind of tying into that hyper femme play on masculine shapes. They also have this dandy like artistic quality to a lot of the elements and the visuals that they use i'll pop in a reference of what i mean by dandy and the dandies and the historical um context of what the dandies were it makes sense with this it makes sense with what paloma spain is known for in their signatures so love that so you have another black and white look this looks like a nice little tuxedo smoking jacket this fringe off the shoulder cape is nasty no notes no notes another nice nicely tailored tuxedo jacket as you can see the shoulders are aligned there is nothing askew nothing drooping the tailored to perfection that's how a jacket is supposed to fit if you're going to go oversized and exaggerated it has to be balanced and this one is balanced this is what got me i was gagged at the accessories and the jewelry like, are you kidding me right now? And when I first saw the jewelry, especially like the earrings and the neck pieces, I was like, that looks like Chulili. Those look like Chulili sculptures. Or if Chulili decided to collaborate with a jewelry brand, like that is what, in my mind, it would look like. It's so brilliant. And it's such wearable art. Like those earrings, like I hope, I hope they go into production with those. The bags, tying in the, the heavy jewelry up top with the bag, <sighs> sickening. And then of course the bag has like this little charm detail that's trending too now that I don't think it's gonna go away. So they kind of tapped into that. And then this also brings me to my next point about runway styling. And this is a whole other section that I could dive deep in another video or whatever. There's, a major difference between runway styling, editorial styling, personal styling. Those are all different, different areas, different worlds. Okay. And you can always tell, in my opinion, brand brings in an outside stylist to style and merchandise the collection for a runway show. And you can also tell when the designer or the design team decides to style for a runway show because at the end of the day there's levels to this and not every designer is a stylist if that makes sense and that's kind of weird to think about because like when you're designing a collection like yeah you are thinking about this top goes with this i'm gonna make this a set nah, nah, nah. but even in my experience i think i would still want to bring in another set of stylistic eyes even though i do in my mind kind of merchandise and style as i design you still need that extra set of eyes and there are people who are specialized in runway styling like masters of putting forth runway styling and runway visuals i'm gonna break down why it's important here or what i'm seeing here when it comes to runway styling one of the biggest elements is definitely learning how to layer 
the pieces effectively and layer them in an interesting way. If you break it down, especially like if you look at some of the big shows when it comes to how things are styled, like a lot of it is just layering different pieces on top of different pieces on top of different pieces. It's not like a super, super complicated thing to try to do, but it's all like in the details. How they layer with color, texture, prints, how that aligns with the accessories that they decide to put with the look, how that aligns with the jewelry, how that aligns with the footwear and the makeup and the head. Like there's all, all these like little moving parts where it looks kind of like, okay, they just layered like three different tops on top of each other. Like who cares? No, 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 no. So for this look in particular, we have these super, super large oversized exaggerated cuffs that are popping out of this blazer. They could have possibly styled it where the blazer kind of covers the cuffs or covers more surface area of the cuff, but no, they decided to push that sleeve up, show off this cuff, because this cuff is repeated throughout the collection, so they are highlighting that feature of the shirt. We have three different layers, and so the hem of the blazer and the button-down shirt are still aligned to the same length so your eye naturally will go to the cuffs which are the highlight here i want to say that embellishment is on the tongue of the loafer they could have chosen to just cover the shoe with the trouser but no they decided to put that pant leg behind that embellishment so that is the first thing that you see when you look down so all those elements work together work in tandem the little bulbs of the top of the earring work with the little bulbs on the top of the shoe so we are styling from truly styling from head to toe look six like i said 1930s 1920s jazz age zoot suit i really wish that they would have maybe nipped in the waist a little bit so, so it is that true like zoot suit shape a scarf coming off of the lapel that is so sickening and that's so chic next we go into the browns and the neutrals, this all brown suiting looks nice. Look eight might be one of my favorites. And this is a perfectly merchandised look. Every part of this look is sellable. We have strong eyewear and eyewear focus. We have an embellished cardigan with the accompanying button down with the exaggerated collar that we've been seeing and the exaggerated cuff all embellished. I wanna say it's like more of a futuristic space AG like belt with the Palomo logo so sellable like that's gonna be a standout piece a little matching mini short and you can't go wrong with a little nice riding welly boot and then this bag like every single piece of this look is super sellable to me and it's just styled so well like to have the button closure just up top expose the chest to show off that belt Ooh, look 10 when i tell you i almost screamed when i saw this like, do you see that jacket? Do you see that jacket? This little starburst embellished um, crystal pattern thing they have going on at the chest and then embellishing the collar, really tying in some of those Western elements that I talked about before. And this cute little ruffle collar underneath that hard and soft juxtaposition is so good. And once again, going back to the styling and the intentionality of the styling, we have the ruffles from that shirt coming out of the sleeve of the jacket. So you really see those layers and you can see the texture of that little cute, delicate baby ruffle, like, oh, so good. I need that jacket. I want that jacket so bad. <laughs> this purple group was so, so good to me. Look 15, like that shirt, that draped, tied and gathered one shoulder shirt that is going to sell a hundred percent next year. Like that is such a cool interpretation of a classic white t-shirt. And you can tell that fabric is so soft and silky and has like the nicest slippy like hand feel. Like you can tell the thing like moves like water. So the fabric here, perfect choice. This drop shoulder for the sleeve, perfect choice. And it looks like the, the top of the tie at the one shoulder kind of has a little bit of a structure there. I wouldn't be mad if they had a little tiny shoulder pad there, kind of giving that angled structure on one side and then this super rounded 
drooped shoulder on the other like that's kind of a cool play I have some of their classic silky button downs with this um, embellished tie situation they've done that before in the past there's something about a spring fur a spring animal fiber but you can do it and you can execute it well that is money and I love how they followed the two furs at one after the other so we have this lilac lavender fur this sheer embellished crystallized set underneath like the heaviness of the fur with this light sheerness in the set heaviness and light playing with heavy textures light textures great balance that's probably one of the best words i could use to describe this collection is that it's so well balanced you can tell thought was put into every single piece every single look like there is a continuous through line like the idea is executed from start to finish from head to toe and i appreciate that that is work that is craftsmanship that is what you do like look 20 was the one where i was like okay they they know what they're doing they they came for blood because beyond just the volume and the shape and the grandioseness of this orange burnt orange fiery orange fur to have that big chulili earring just coming off of that and then having this little embellished bag just kind of sit on top of the fur i interpret it almost as like a brooch that you would put on a fur i guess this was an intentional design choice to not have this as a center front closure it looks like it's angled or it's closing diagonally across the body and it's close to a point where it's giving almost like a high slit so when the model is walking you can see that boot and that boot oh my god yeah they ate this up these chulili crazy irregular neck pieces oh so good i love these high neck column dresses with these beautiful draped sleeves that kind of pull around the wrist and then you have like this it almost looks like little accordion pleats at the side to give some shape and then you see some um shaping as well around the bust this beaded layered fringe pant with that belt and then their classic halter tie silk shirt nasty see these pants selling especially in time for the festival season next year like absolutely i love the little hot short moments those are always so cute so good and then you have this gorgeous, gorgeous sequined paillette moment. I can totally see this being placed in so many different publications on so many red carpets. So let's go down the criteria and see where this lands. So for me, approachable, absolutely. I think this is right in line with their customer base with fans of the brand i'm a fan of the brand and it's speaking to me i think this is also going to be a brand that attracts a larger women's wear customer base and clientele i can definitely see more women gravitating towards some of these some of these tops some of these bottoms the jackets especially the jewelry and accessories like it's a given absolutely wearable they covered a wide range of just occasions and different sensibilities you have your more day-to-day -day, i guess their interpretation of like a casual looks with some of the shorts you have your suiting your evening wear they included bridal will this be available i think for this collection to be as elevated as it is and for them to use some of the fabrics and the techniques and the construction elements that they have used in this collection i do think a lot of this will actually be produced i really do one shoulder tee i can see that moving units easily all the outerwear i have those exaggerated collar and cuff button downs super easy to sell i really hope they put those accessory pieces in the jewelry into production i'm like crossing my fingers so i can definitely see a lot of buyers and editors being very happy with this collection visually it's very easy to kind of interpret and merchandise and think about how it will be placed online and in the store so is this collection telling a story is it telling a narrative is it saying something and i absolutely think that it is i think they have definitely taken what they consider menswear up a notch i think the hyper femme 
aesthetic that they're making their signature was taken up a notch. I think they have incorporated way more signature silhouettes and way more signature details and kind of are creating their own little group of iconic silhouettes. So I really hope they continue with this western sort of motif that they keep doing. I really hope that is something that we continue to see. They keep expanding that accessory and jewelry range. I think the interpretation is definitely clear as far as referencing the jazz age, the 1920s, 1930s, flappers, zoot suits, excess. I think their approach as a whole, as a brand, their growth, their progression is kind of like the model that I would want to follow. Because they didn't start off with, you know, having really big shows, doing a lot of really big moments. They took their time. They made sure that their brand represented craftsmanship, represented execution. They really developed what their brand voice is going to be and who their customer is. And they have fine-tuned that over the years, over these seasons and these showings that we've seen. And I think it's definitely working out for them. So I think they hit every mark. I didn't see any construction issues. The fit was great. The styling was great. Just overall 10 out of 10. So Paloma Spain, y'all ate that up. That is it for this section of my little New York Fashion Week design analysis review. We'll discuss more designers, more looks, and go into the details about all of that. I hope you enjoyed this part.